Good morning, and welcome to the worship service of the Clayton Church of Christ, Clayton, New Mexico. We're recording this morning from the studios of JESUS in Amarillo today, the traveling studio. We'll call this a, a fireside chat because I'm seated on the hearth next to the fireplace. Today, I want us to begin to look again at the book of Ephesians. We had a series on Ephesians about a year ago, but I wanted us to get back into some of the depths of the book. So, we're looking at blessing God who blessed us. Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus is an essential foundation of the New Testament and it warrants frequent visits and deeper understanding. So I want us to, to dig back another level in the book today. Any portion of the Bible has basic truths that never change. But the applications and the particular emphasis always changes with time and circumstances. Twenty-five years ago, in teaching this book to my students at Panhandle State University, I would have stressed different things, emphasized different things than I do today, because times have changed. But the Word of God never changes. I want to have an overview for a moment of the book of, of Ephesians. Ephesians is a sister letter to the letter of the Colossians. Two-thirds of the contents of Paul's letter to the Colossians can be found in some way paralleled to Ephesians. The message of Ephesians is a universal message to all followers of Jesus outlining the identity and responsibility of the Church of Christ in a dark world. Recently, the world has seemed darker to me in, in a number of different ways. Uh, political, personal, my work, all these things, but that's exactly what the book of Ephesians is for. It's an encouraging word. It's a positive word. Many have spoken of the greatness of this letter. Luther called it the gospel in its purest expression. Now, I don't agree with a lot of the positions Martin Luther took, but I certainly agree with this statement of Martin Luther. Wouldn't you love to know why Luther thought this was the gospel in its purest expression? That's why I wanted to dig a little deeper. Others see Ephesians as a panoramic view of this wondrous, glorious work of God in Jesus our Lord. It is a most vital message to the Church of Christ today. As is all Scripture, it's profitable for teaching, doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God, the child of God, may become mature and perfectly trained for every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It's my hope that as we encounter the truths of this portion of the Bible, and, and mind some of its numerous precious jewels that we'll find ourselves filled to overflowing with the praise of God and even more transformed into the image of Christ than we were before we began this sermon series. If I were to single out a particular theme in Ephesians that would best express the intent of the letter, it might be this the identity and responsibility of the church. Ephesians is one of the many epistles or letters 
written to specific churches or individuals. Some of these letters were intended to be shared and passed between the churches in various cities. The bulk of these letters were written by the Apostle Paul. A letter is a personal communication and is to a specific audience with a particular purpose. They were often used and triggered by issues related to a particular church. These letters, by reason of personal nature, were not intended to be a theology class, although they contain significant theological concepts. The first part of the letter provides sufficient background information. In this case, both the author and the intended recipients are clearly identified. No question about them. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. It is clear from the introduction, content, and style of this letter that it was Paulinian, or a letter from Paul. Paul used similar style and vocabulary in all of his writings. Paul identifies himself as an apostle. Well, let's unwrap that word a minute. It means one sent out with the authority of another. It is used 10 times in the Gospels, 28 times in the book of Acts, 38 times in the letters, and three times in the book of Revelation. It's used in a general sense of anyone with a, with a special message sent uh, to, to deliver it with someone's authority by the will and authority of God, these messages are sent. Paul affirms Jesus Christ as his sending agent. And the, the letter is sent by the will and the authority of God himself. He thus establishes the authoritative nature of the letter. He spoke on God's behalf. Now, the time of writing seems to have been somewhere between 61 and 63 A.D. This was the period of time when Paul was in prison. Ephesians is one of the of several letters that were written while he was in prison in Rome. The letter is believed to be written by Paul in his house arrest in Rome and is thus categorized as a prison epistle, a prison letter along with Colossians and Philippians. This was a rich period in the life and ministry of Paul. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was called, taught, and personally discipled by Christ and had seen and experienced much as God's special messenger to the Gentiles. He suffered great persecution and hardship that few of us will ever experience and he remained true to his calling and to the one who called him to the very, very end. At the writing of this letter, Paul remained in prison for his faith. And God delegated this time to get some writing done, some vital truths that have become the solid foundation for the Church of Christ today. Paul focused on three things concerning the members of the congregation at Ephesus. First, he, for, he uh, focused on the word saints. He called them saints. Now, the term saint comes from the word holy, to be set apart for a special use. We know from other passages that God considered every genuine follower of Jesus a saint, every uh, obedient Christian, every baptized believer a saint. It's God's designation and God's viewpoint of us. It's how He sees us. That is our identity. We are His special people set apart for a special work by Him 
for His pleasure. It doesn't mean that we always act like saints. Paul addressed, in, in the congregation of Ephesus, Paul addressed lying, stealing, bad language, unhealthy family relationships, and sexual immorality. Yet, because of their relationship with Christ, Paul still called them saints, not sinners. We need to follow the, the pattern of Scripture, not the pattern of the evil one. We, we want to know we are saints. We are saved by the blood of Jesus. And therefore, because we believe, we're called saints. We're not just rotten sinners, merely saved by grace. We are saints by the grace of God, who do indeed sin, but called, by, called saints by God Himself. Now we must continually keep our true identity as special children of God foremost in our thinking. Church, we are chosen by God's grace foremost. So many people toward the end wonder, have I done enough? And we have to remember, it's not about us. We have to have faith that Jesus did all that was necessary. We sin, we fall, we're forgiven, and we're called saints by God. We are people for God's own purpose and pleasure, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation. Now the second thing that Paul called them was faithful. This word comes from the same root translated faith, believe, or trust. Paul acknowledged their part in the special relationship. They were those who put their faith and trust in Jesus our Lord. They were not just trusting in anyone. They were trusting in Jesus. Their faith was firmly rooted in Christ Jesus. And, and you know, I emphasize the in Christ. That's so important in this letter and in every other letter. It was this faith in Jesus that put them in such a privileged and special relationship with God to be called saints. This word comes from the same root word uh, of faith, and we need to remember our faith. Now, folks, these were not super Christians, as some religions would treat that word today. They were not extraordinarily gifted individuals either. These people were only special by reason of their faith in Christ. These were common folk, slaves, rich, educated, uneducated. Paul wrote this letter so that they would understand just what God had done in them and what God wanted to do through them. Third, Paul identified their location as Ephesus. It's significant that this is a group of people living in a pagan culture. The culture of the day was not unlike what we face today. I find even on the Hallmark Channel, there are things slipping in on, in, in, in all those really heartwarming uh, mysteries or, or uh, love stories, even the Christmas ones, that are worldly and frustrating to me. But our culture is much more than the Hallmark Channel. Our culture is in, in so many ways like Ephesus. Ephesus and the surrounding area were a melting pot. 
due to its location as a seaport and trade route. Ephesus was the location of a major temple of Diana, the goddess of love, complete with idol worship and rampant sexual perversion through male and female temple prostitutes. That's right. In order to worship their gods, they went into prostitution. Archaeology has unearthed a great deal of evidence depicting how corrupt the nature of this area was, so corrupt that it would make even Corinth blush. It is to this degraded and disintegrating society God rose up a generation of faith-empowered followers of Jesus in need of faith-building truths contained in this letter from Paul. The gospel seed planted by this group of people sprouted and spread and transformed a whole culture in the first century. Great revival and victory over the corruption of the culture is recorded in the book of Acts. Paul spent considerable time teaching day and night and exhorting personally with tears. Ephesians chapter 2. There was a stand taken against witchcraft of the day and a house cleaning was followed by a great bonfire which Ephesians burned their magic books, Acts 19. Later, in their history, we read the exhortation dictated to John to the church at Ephesus by the Holy Spirit, who this group at Ephesus now had lost their first love for the Savior, but they had not lost their grasp on the truth. They were commended for their doctrinal tenacity, but exhorted to repent and return to their devotional tenderness. Now, for a moment, let's look at the greeting. Paul began this letter by expressing his heart's desire for the well-being of the church, of the saints in Ephesus. Verse 2, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace, Kalis and shalom. Some call this the overture to a spiritual symphony. Grace and peace. This salutation reflects the greatest need of fallen man, followed by the greatest longing for fallen man. The greatest need is grace. The greatest longing is peace. Grace flows through this whole book. The basic concept of grace has to do with favor granted irrespective of merit. Some have called it unmerited favor. Others refer to it as God's riches at Christ's at Christ expense. That's an acrostic. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. I had a young student in an 8th grade Bible class once tell me that her version was God's righteousness at Christ's expense. And I like that one too. The concept is the same. It indicates blessing, favor, and gifts given regardless of personal merit. God gives the gifts no matter who or what you are or what you have done, unmerited favor. If it's merited, it's called a wage. Grace and favor is extended out of the generosity and kindness of the, of the giver. Scripture employs grace in at least five areas of our life. So there's in all those times we find the word grace, there are five different areas of grace that we need to look at. First is common grace. Favor shown on everyone. 
the rain falls on the good and the bad by the grace of God. Then there's saving grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Favor extended for salvation, saving grace. And then there's living or enabling grace, Hebrews 4, 16. Favor or energy extended for everyday living. The kind of grace I pray for every day. Lord, help me uh, through the difficulties of this day. Bless me as I strive uh, to help others and to serve you. This day, living grace, number three. Number four, resurrection grace. 1 Peter 1.13 Favor promised at Christ's return. I mean, grace is, is so full that we're not going to get it all here. When Christ returns, we're going to get another big portion of it. Can't wait for that. And then there's eternal grace. Number five, eternal grace. Favor that will be shown throughout eternity. Ephesians 2, 7. Just down a few passages, uh, uh, verses from, from where we started. Since Paul writes to those already part of the kingdom through the saving grace, I believe he's envisioning here living grace. Favor or energy extended for everyday living. Living grace. And, and it's good to note that this book is written to people who have already obeyed the gospel. This book is written to people who already believe in Jesus. Now, those who are outside the body of Christ can read the book and get a lot from it. But note that you can't get everything from this book if you are not an obedient Christian. That's when it all becomes much more understandable. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paul wishes his grace to grant the Ephesians the grace to continue to live faithful and, and uh, peaceful lives in a hostile world. And more and more, our world is getting more difficult and more difficult to live faithfully. And it's not just because Christians are often ostracized. Even those who call themselves Christians are ostracizing conservative believers. But it's also because Satan is working in the world. Uh, Satan is bringing us viruses and, and challenges uh, to our worship. When, when folks tell us we, we can't get together because we might spread a virus, we get concerned that somehow there's going to be control over religion. So our world is hostile too. In the first century, Christians were told they couldn't worship. Uh, it wasn't a virus, but it was governmental control. Now, he wishes God to grant them peace. Peace is the outcome of grace. It's the sense of tranquility, blessing that comes from a restored relationship with God. It's this sense of tranquility, blessing, that comes from a restored relationship with God that, that was used to refer to a reconciliation, a bringing together. The source of these foundations of life is God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter indicates in 2 Peter 1-2 that the multiplication of this duo in our daily living comes through an increased knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Paul verbalized his desire that God grant and that they find the full fulfillment of their greatest needs. The fulfillment of their greatest needs. That's what, that's what Paul was praying for. He prayed for power to live a life of faith in this age. He was praying that they 
in Ephesus would be able to be faithful in their surrounding. Our prayer today is that God would allow us to be faithful in our age. Realization of a restored and secure relationship with Jesus with nothing to prove, nothing to lose, nothing to protect, and therefore nothing to fear. That's what we want, to be able to worship God with nothing to fear. Now, I want to end with the basic outline of the book. First of all is the greeting, and we've been going through the greeting. The next, we want to see that the, the next section is for, uh, chapters 1 through 3, our wealth and worth, where? In Christ. Our wealth and worth in Christ. Not out of Christ, but in Christ. Now, the second section is chapters uh, 4 through 6 the beginning of chapter 6, our walk with Christ. So the first one is our wealth and worth in Christ. Now we're looking at our walk with Christ. And number three, our welfare, or excuse me, our warfare for Christ. You remember chapter 6 is where we find uh, the, all the armor for the soldier of Christ. And we're looking at the warfare, the spiritual warfare, and how we need to be ready to fight it. And then Paul gives a farewell. Now, that's an overview of this book. And that is, is what I wanted us to, to look at this morning. Now, we will look further in to this first section next week. But we have a background now. And... And we understand that it's for uh, church members, members of the Church of Christ, to be able to live a faithful, hopeful life. And here's where I want to give an invitation to those who may be watching this video that have not obeyed the gospel. There are so many believers in Christ who don't understand that you get into Christ by obeying His will. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. I want you to be saved. And I would like for you to contact someone in a church of Christ near you to explain what this means. Now, that's all the lesson this morning. Uh, the prayer is for you to live in peace and that may God bless you and give you that peace. So until we meet again, may the good Lord take a liking to you and happy trails.